Abhinindra Gupta. Are you there, Dr. Abhinindra? Yeah, yeah. Uh, convener, Dr. Pradeep Mahanta. Co-convener, Dr. Deepak Mishra. Moderator, Dr. Bharat Gurnani. So may I request Dr. Arvind, please do come. Dr. Pradeep Mahanta is there? Yeah, please, please take, take your chair. And we'll be starting the session. The first talk, Dr. Devi Aishwarya Das, CSCXL in Thin Corneas with Keratoconus. Dr. Devi Aishwarya Das from Odisha. She's a consultant at Agarwal Sai Hospital, Katak. She's a cornea consultant. It's over to her. Next talk. Up other beto na. Pradeep. Dr. Pradeep. Maha beto. Udra beto. Please be seated. Dr. Jyotir Mai Vishwas, sir, is there? Yes, sir. Dr. Jagdish Birazdar. Yes, sir. Dr. Jayashri Dora, she is there. Dr. Sasmita Sahu. She is not. Last is Dr. Ravindra Kumar Choudhury. Yes, it's ready. Please go. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, I'll be talking about uh, uh, CSC excellent keratoconus in thin corneas. So I have no financial disclosures here. Uh, so coming to the role of cross-linking in keratoconus, it's uh, now uh, known that uh, this, uh, the linking that is inherently weak in keratoconus, conventional cross-linking has shown to make the cornea nearly 300 times stiffer. So this uh, effectively uh, adverts the need for a transplant or if at all it delays, uh, delays, the, uh, delays the transplant. And now it is also known that it is uh, visually rehabilitative in the fact that it uh, causes uh, flattening in the long term. And it can be combined with other procedures like CARES and uh, intracorneal uh, ring segments. So essentially the role of riboflavin is it absorbs the UV light, acts as a photosynthesizer and it promotes cross-linking reaction. It also uh, absorbs UV light so that uh, uh, the endothelium lens and the retina are protected from the toxic uh, side effects of UV light. So when do we cross-link? Uh, when, when do we cross-link? So when, uh, uh, ideally when uh, we see progression in the keratoconus, uh, so the uh, criteria are written there, uh, manifest refraction uh, increasing more than one diopter per year, K-max more than one diopter per year, K-max uh, minus K min more than one diopter increase per year, then 2% decrease in the corne central corneal thickness, increase in the central K power more than 1.5 from baseline per year and manifest cylinder increase more than 0.5 diopter per year. When do we cross-link link earlier? Sometimes when we see a young patient less than 14 years, we know that this is a progressive disease. So we do cross-link earlier. Uh, above 8 years is, uh, uh, we have, uh, cro uh, above 8 years you can cross-link corneas. Though USFDA doesn't allow uh, cross-linking below 14 years. Other studies have shown that uh, children above 8 years, when cross-linked earlier, there's a better stabilization of the disease. Pachymetry less than 425 microns because there is very little window space for you to go for a standard cross-linking. Documented progression, of course. Family history of keratoconus with progression. Pa patients who have associated sev uh, severe allergy because they ten tend to rub the eyes and the progression is faster. And if a patient has other eye high drops, or we see a possibility of loss to follow up in such patients, we opt for an earlier cross-link. So we have a CXL treatment algorithm. I'll, I'll just go to the thinner corneas. So what is the issue with thinner corneas? Penetrance of UVA is up to anterior 300 microns of deepithelized cornea. So when we uh, land up in a situation where we know that after removing epithelium, we don't have sufficient stroma left, that is when we have to think of other uh, other alternatives uh, to the standard cross-linking. 
If the DFL is cornea is too thin below 400 microns, there is a chance for UV toxicity to the underlying endothelium lens and macula. And in this case, if you keep the UV radiation too superficial, then the depth of the cross-linking wouldn't achieve enough corneal rigidity, so the purpose would be defeated. So in a CACXL, that is a contact lens assisted uh, cross-linking, uh, this complex provides an extra buffer of about 107 to 110 microns to prevent deeper UVA penetration. So that is how we prevent endotoxicity uh, to the endothelium. But does this suffice to give the cornea enough, uh, enough strength, rigidity in future? That is to be seen. So let's take few uh, few scenes where uh, we have the minimum uh, packy falling uh, about 420, 430. Uh, so we know if you remove the epithelium, let's remove say about 55 microns, we are left with sub 400 level uh, thickness of stroma. So these are the situations where a uh, standard CXL would not uh, work. In these cases, we, ha we have to think of other alternatives. So what are the other alternatives that are known? One is use of hypotonic riboflavin, transepithelial uh, cross-linking, then contact lens associated uh, assisted cross-linking, smile lenticular assisted cross-linking. So these have all been tried. So this is the uh, algorithm for uh, um, contact lens assisted. If PACI is more than 400 microns after removing epithelium, we can go for a conventional CXL. But if the PACI falls short of 400 microns, then we ha after removal of epithelium, then we have to think of a contact lens assisted. Then we uh, take up these patients for contact lens assisted uh, um, cross-linking. So after after applying uh, intraoperative pachymetry is a must. If after applying riboflavin for more than 30 minutes we see that the pachymetry is above 400 microns, we go ahead with the cross-linking. If we see that it is slightly short of 400 microns, that is with the contact lens complex, then we can add a little of uh, distilled water at uh, 10 minutes interval so that we attain a uh, thickness of 400 microns of the whole complex. So what are the disadvantages in the other methods? That endothelial cell loss uh, in con conventional and point one uh, hypoosmolar riboflavin use was seen. Transient swelling of stroma and thinnest packet falling below, significantly below after 10 to 30 minutes of dextran based riboflavin application. So while we are cross-linking, the thickness that we have achieved before cross-linking that falls drastically. In transepithelial uh, cross-linking, we do not achieve that much amount of uh, stiffness. The contact lens riboflavin complex, we get an extra buffer of 107 to 110 microns. So essentially the process is the same, except that while we are applying drops on the cornea, riboflavin drops on the cornea, simultaneously we have soaked a uh, 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 non-UV barrier uh, co free contact lens uh, in riboflavin solution. So this is also soaked for 30 minutes, intraoperative packy is always a must and then before we start cross-linking, this riboflavin-soaked con contact lens is placed on the cornea and then it is exposed to UV light for 20 minutes as opposed to 30 minutes for standard cross-linking. At the end of the procedure, wash, it's washed thoroughly, bandaged contact lens is placed, antibiotic eye drops are applied and the standard post-operative uh, post regime is the same, topical uh, antibiotics till lipid defect heals. So we have, a, we, in our case, we had a uh, case series where we took up 30 cases and we, uh, the results, can I take one minute, half minute, it's up, okay, so, uh, so in our case series of 30 patients, uh, we achieved, uh, none of the patients showed progression at the end of one year and subsequently they have been followed up for more than three to five years. None of them have shown any progression. Uh, Im immediate post-operatively also all, all were uh, doing good except three cases in which had persistent uh, haze that took an extra month to uh, be reversed medically. So in conclusion, it's a uh, contact lens assisted corneal collagen cross-linking is a safe technique that offers promising results in the management of patients with progressive keratoconus and thinner pachymetry values, which are not amenable to treatment by the standard procedure. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No. Our moderator, would you like to say something? Please. 
We have Dr. John here. Dr. John, any inputs or any comments? Yeah, we use HPMC or isosmolar, not dextran. Presently, actually, I combine the thing is epi on and epi off. So, so I have done a series of patient ma'am. I presented in the ECRS also. So presently, I'm combine the epi on and epi off. And the thing I just maintain the central islands of the epithelium. The remaining mid periphery, I remove the epithelium. So one advantage, adding advantage is that that is a modification of the HPMC one. So central as a central epithelium intact. So next morning, the patient having the visual central visual intact. It is symptomatically better and the early healing will be there. So I didn't put on the even of the B-cells. Within 24 to 40 hours, and the epithelium regenerated. And we have done the such analysis of the both the group. Total entire epi off and, and combined AP off, AP on. Both are showing the same, the halting the progression of the statistical one. Now what about the ASOCT level of the demarcation line? Demarcation is same, ma'am. Same, same, same. Like do you get a flat line or you get the hat on? Hat on, ma'am. Hat, hat on line. Hat on line, ma'am. Because uh, this way there would be less penetrance in the center. It is the not the center part, there's less penetration than it is not. Because we have earlier already this proven factor. On yeah. the long run, whenever we have done the combined AP on AP on, both are, both are more or less, both the same, ma'am. The efficacy wise, the efficacy of the, of according to the, halting the progression. Main motto is the halting the progression. And even also previous thought process was that even before the 400, we can't go, the, go ahead with the procedure. But I have a series of patients, ma'am, we have done the 40, 40 50 patients. And all the having the cutoff value is the less than 400. Oh. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, may I request Dr. Jyotirmay Vishwas, sir, please do uh, talk on ophthalmic pathology per clinicians. I think everybody knows Dr. Jyotirmay Vishwas. He is from Shankar Natralaya. He is the head of the UBI department. And, uh, yeah. He has a vast experience in this topic, both pathology and UVA. Uh, we have had, heard his talk many times. Sir, so over to you. Good evening. I'll be talking on ophthalmic pathology for the clinicians. I'd like to thank AIOS midterm um, session, ophthalmic pathology, uh, giving the opportunity. Ophthalmic pathology for the clinicians can be very important. And it was William Osler, a Canadian medic uh, clinician who told long back, 200 years back, as is our pathology, so is our practice. This is true in ophthalmic pathology also. Outline of that, my talk is how to send ophthalmic pathology specimen. Basic question, what are the techniques used in ophthalmic pathology, stains used in ophthalmic pathology, what is the normal histology of the eye and adnexa and clinical pathological correlation in few ophthalmic diseases? So what we do in the histopathology department? We do the fixation, grossing, tissue processing, paraffin embedding, sectioning, and finally staining, and see under the microscope. Fixative used in the ophthalmic pathology and routine histopathology, we use 10% neutral buffered formalin. And cytology, we use 95% ethyl alcohol. Electron microscopy, 2.5% glutaraldehyde. We are less and less doing electron microscopy nowadays. So how much time is required for fixation? Corneal button, 6 hours. Globe or large orbital mass, 24 hours. Exentated specimen, 72 hours. Don't ask for report within 6 hours of an enucleated globe. We do the transformation first. We find out the location of the tumor. Where is the tumor located, a suspected intraocular tumor? Then we do the grossing. After the grossing, we, before the grossing, we cut the sec globe into the sections, people optic nerve sections we make, and then we see under the microscope. Then the gross microscope. Mm. Then we put on the automatic tissue processor when the specimen is processed through the separate graded alcohol. Then we embed in the paraffin wax. And finally, you do the sectioning, three to six micron sections is taken, which is, in case of uh, frozen section, we use the cryostat. The temperature is minus 20 degrees centigrade. This is a basal cell carcinoma, and you can see that there is a 
tumor mass extending to the margin and is the frozen section uh, tumor, frozen section uh, study. Cytology, where you do this, use the machine called cytospin, which revolves 1000 RPM for five minutes. And the cells are concentrated like this. And we can see elegantly the cytology of the specimens concentrated smear. This is a calcophore stain showing clumps of fungus. You can see the fungus ball over there. Stains used in ophthalmic pathology is a routine staining, hematoxyl neosin stain. Stains for organism fungus, gomodimethanamine silver stain, as I shown, um, I'll be showing. Bacteria gram stain, brown hops method, acid fast bacilli, gel Nelson stain. This is a hematoxyl neosin stain. Cytoplasm appears pink and the nuclei appears blue, and this is a flexner winterstener rosette is seen with a central clear lumen. In case of fungus, we do the gomorimethanamine silver stain. Fungus will appear black in the background of the blue color. Dillinson stain uh, showing A, B is uh, uh, the pink color uh, bacilli is seen under the blue background. This is a conjunctival tuberculoma which is uh, uh, excised and the specimen on paraffin section on special stain shown the acid fast bacilli. What are the uh, special stains? Connective tissue mason trichrome stain, mucin, alcyon blue or periodic acid sip stain, iron, pulse prussian blue, fat, oil red, this is done in the frozen section, calcium, alizarin red, amyloid, congo red. Trichrome stain, this is an example of a granular corneal dystrophy and you can see the clear spaces in between the corneal opacity and hyaline material is seen on the trichrome stain as a red color. And this is a macular dystrophy when the diffuse opacity is there, there is no space seen over there. Alcyon blue showing the acid mucopolysaccharide stain, staining blue in color, blue in color and colloidal iron also staining blue in color acid mucopolysaccharide in mucopolysaccharidosis. Lattice corneal dystrophy where the lattice lines are there, crisscross lines, and these lines are actually amyloid material which stains positive with Congo red. And if you use the polarized light, is the apple green birefringence will be seen. In case of Sebastian's gland carcinoma, you will get the foamy cytoplasm with the tumor cells. And you can see use the oil red stain in frozen section with the fat lobules within the malignant cells will appear as the red color. Normal histology of the eye, this is the lead, it contains the epithe epidermis, dermis, dermis contains striated muscle fibers, mevumian glands, hair follicles, accessory glands, etc. And this is a conjunctiva, normal conjunctiva, which con contain uh, goblet cells, the, the foamy cells, which are pink in color with acid mucopolysaccharide seen inside that one, and the stroma has got vascular channels. And this is a normal cornea, five-layer epithelium, Bowman's layer, stroma, desmus membrane, endothelium cells, four layers. And this is the um, normal lens is seen over there, and this is the optic nerve head, and there is a lamina cubrosa is seen. And this is the whole globe in the cut section of the globe stained with the hematoxylin neosin stain. What is this tumor? This is a cut section of the globe enucleated in a two-year-old child. This is a chalky white mass, typically characteristic of retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma is important um, to find out uh, the histopathology pattern, you can see the flexner intestinal rosette, homarite rosette. Um, the flexner intestinal rosette has got clear lumen, homarite rosette do not have clear lumen. And you need to see the optic nerve end, uh, head invasion is there or not. There can be non uh, uh, rosettes or flores that is called undifferentiated type of retinoblastoma. What we want to see in case of retinoblastoma to rule out coital invasion as well as the optic nerve invasion, quadral invasion and optic nerve invasion indicates poor prognosis for the life. Role of the pathologist. Role of the pathologist is to confirm the clinical diagnosis, to identify the extent of the tumor spread, to assess the risk for metastasis, to guide the clinician in the management. And this is a malignant melanoma of the choroid, mushroom shaped pigmented tumor mass, Color stud appearance is seen over there. And these are the spindle cells, tightly packed cells with the 
insignificant uh, cytoplasm and nuclei is a um, prominent epithelial cell is the lot of cytoplasm is there nucleus and nucleoli is prominent mixed is both spindle and epithelioid cells are seen orbit is a pandora's box you can get any kind of tumor this is a 24 year old man who has got axial proptosis you can see intraconus mass lesion and histopathology is showed adenoid cystic carcinoma with the cribriform pattern of the tumor cells and there is a perineural invasion is seen. This is a 60 year old man, painless swelling in the lid and you can see the smooth the homogeneous mass over the eyelid and histopathology showed monomorphic lymphoid cells suggestive of non-Hitchkin's lymphoma and you need to do the immunohistochemistry. Immunohistochemistry with the B cell marker and T cell marker is done and here B cell marker is positive indicating that this is a B cell lymphoma which is most common uh, to, uh, lymphoma in the orbit. So in conclusion, histopathology provided the gold standard in diagnosis, guides clinician in management, intraoperative like basal cell carcinoma, frozen section diagnosis, postoperative tumor extent and invasion in retinoblastoma, and the intra-excessical extension in malignant melanoma of the choroid. And you can understand the disease better by clinical pathological correlation. Yes, it can be interesting also. So, this has been told by, as I mentioned earlier, William Mosler, Canadian uh, clinician, who told, uh, who is a legendary clinician, who said, as is our pathology, so is our practice. This is also true in ophthalmic pathology. As is our ophthalmic pathology, so would be our practice. Thank you very much. Any, any comments, your side? So, our moderator, may I ask to have your comments? Any questions from the audience? Uh, do you take samples from outside or you process the yeah, samples? Yeah, uh, we take outside, uh, not only from uh, this country, also from all other yes. country also. So okay. what is the process of sending samples to you? They, they put, fix in the 10% neutral buffer formalin, courier it, tight, put in a tight sealed container and send it. We are seeing the specimens, about 3,000 specimens per year we are seeing. Most of the specimens are from outside the country outside the uh, Chennai. And uh, uh, what is the financial implications? Uh, so we charge a minimum charge of that one. There is not really much consultation charge, processing charge which you can. Uh, we send the report by email. Yes. Uh, and if you request, you can send a glass slide and my micro photograph also. Yeah, that's a important thing because uh, Dr. Jyotiramai Bishwas is one of the only person or one of uh, two persons doing ocular pathology in the country. And uh, if you have any doubt, you can always uh, send the samples. We'd like to uh, uh, have the address circulated so that uh, it comes with the uh, uh, Shankara Netralaya Foundation. Or yeah, what Shankara Netralaya you will find. You just uh, Google it to my name, you will get it there. Yeah. Dr. Jyotima Viswas. Thank you, sir, so, for a nice illuminating talk. And with this, we'll go to the next talk. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Jagdish Dr. Birazdar, the next talk speaker, he will be speaking the group practice. Definitely works, my experience. So it's a session of uh, all the mixture of several types of topics. Please proceed. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank the scientific, com scientific committee for giving me this opportunity. Let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Jagdish, practicing in Sholapur since last 24 years. I am a solo practitioner, but still today, I am going to talk on group practice definitely works, my experience. You may be surprised to see a solo practitioner talking about the group practice. Yes, I am definitely involved in a group practice. I will tell you how. I started my practice in 1998. It took me almost five to six years to get settled myself. Later on, I realized that ophthalmy is one of the fastest developing branch. And to cope up with the newer technologies and newer instrumentation, it was becoming difficult for me. When I expressed myself in, in front of my friends, I realized that they were also traveling through the same boat. So seven to nine people of us came together and started our first diagnostic center that is called as Solapur Netra Laser Center, where 
we nine of us came together, invested only 50,000 rupees and purchased two instruments, of course, with the help of loan. We had a green laser and an ND YAG laser. We found that it was working very nicely. Later on, we also invested a few more lakh rupees and purchased an OCT machine, a visual field, and even a fundus camera. By the inspiration from this, the core committee, we sat together, and in 2011, we thought that we should have an excimer laser with our group. 16 of us came together. This time, the core committee, we sat together and written a proper business plan. We tapped all the surgeons in and around the places. This is very much important. The reason behind this is, if you don't tap the surgeon around you, he will feel that he may not join you, he may join you, or he should not talk negative thing about your field. So you tap all the surgeons around you. Later on, we have taken a care that involve ophthalmologist only. Few pharma people and even few businessmen were also interested to join with us. But we said no to them. Don't hesitate to soon, uh, say no to them because they have got only financial interest. Only ophthalmic surgeon can understand the problems of an ophthalmologist. Our aim was we should involve the maximum people with the lowest involvement, with lowest cost involvement. We have hardly contributed seven lakh rupees each and 16 of us came together and started a center at a neutral place, which is everybody's center. Nobody should feel that it is his or her, it is everybody's center. And we have started this in 2011. We have taken care that shares should be distributed evenly among everybody. So nobody is bigger, nobody is smaller. We have appointed a strong administrator. What we made compulsory is that all of us 16 of directors went together to the uh, instruction course with Rupal Shah, madam. Even she was impressed. All of 16 of us went together. She also motivated us. And with the inspiration from that, we have started our center. After coming, one more interesting thing what we did is, we called that time the five giant people company were there, Alcon, AMO, Shwind Amiris, Zeiss, and even the NIDAC people. We have given one hour time to each and every company and said that you should tell about the positive thing about your machine, negative thing about others' machine, and what will be the, your lowest possible quotation. The same day, you should not negotiate afterwards. So that was the condition given to them. We had a marathon meeting from morning 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. And by the 5.30 evening, we were ready with our decision. So that, that helped us for you. Whenever you come out with an organization, you should remember that profit should be distributed evenly and fairly. It, in usually, in what happens in a group, everybody feels that it is his job, it is her job. You should take care that it is everybody's job. Ultimately, it should not turn out to be nobody's job. Proper time should be given by the consultant to the institution is very important. We have given the responsibility to all and every directors. Of course, whenever we come in a group, we have got a less flexibility. The simplest example that, even if you want to operate your wife or your husband or your children, so you have to pay charges to the center. So we were strict in that. So certain other rules were also there. If you give an extra effort, you'll run an extra mile. Motivation is very important. We motivated each of us to increase the business. Run formal and fact-based multiple frequent meetings to whatever misunderstanding among ourselves should be cleared off immediately and on there. Remove the wrong doctors quickly. Don't hesitate to remove the doctors. Make the practice as profitable as possible. So definitely, these are the advantages which everybody knows. The less financial burden is the first and foremost advantage. Greater shared clinical experiences and access to information. Greater access to more patients because all of 16 of us were acting as a brand ambassador, so we did not have to advertise for ourselves. Then definitely, we all doctors have a proper, sufficient time for to plan our holidays and even vacations and even also emergency schedules. So ultimately, comprehensive eye health care can be given under one roof. It was the most common advantage. 
So instead of buying a smaller instrument, we can have a higher end instruments like this. But on the other hand, a new practitioner, whenever he comes to market or whenever he comes to practice, the changing scenario makes him difficult. Because nowadays fellowship has become compulsory. By the time he comes out, it almost completes 27 to 30 years of his age. The newer technology he has to catch up. He practices in institution, from there when he comes, he has to invest that much amount what he has seen in the, invest in the, in the institutions. It becomes very difficult for him. Practice pattern is also changing. Even patient's profile is also changing. People are ready to pay, but they want the highest and best technology for them. Even doctors have changed their lifestyle nowadays. They want a leisure time and family time, especially after COVID. So very few options left for the newcomer. And he has got a lot of clinical and financial risk. He has limited resources under control. He has to assess the market and analyze the market. And he should find a balance between the average income and the lifestyle. So ultimately left out with either private practice, group practice, or should join an institution, either government or non-government, either join a corporate hospital, charity, or overseas jobs. A lion may be the king, it's like solo practitioner may be the king, but he may roar. But when many bulls come together, they can even Sorry, cursor is not moving, okay. When many bulls come together, they can make the lion run away. So you can always think that group practice definitely works. It's my experience. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. I have a question. How do you identify wrong doctors and what are the words you use to remove them? See, whenever you are working in that area, you must be knowing that he, that person is a troublesome person. Usually we can analyze by his behavior and everything. It happened initially with us also. I know you should avoid that person from the beginning only. Even if you wanted to join, some points you should find out so that he will not be in the group. So identifying such person is really an intelligent job. For this, we require the senior most person also who can handle the situation. So our group was a mixed group where juniors were there and seniors were also there. One senior, senior most person in that area is must to handle such situations. He can control so, the... Uh, uh, once you have this kind, first thing you should have a uh, memorandum of yes, understanding. Yes, sir. We had a memorandum of understanding. And that should also state what, is our, what are the exit policies. Yes, yes. Because Say, it's very important that if you don't uh, specify the exit policy, yes. then uh, he might expect... Uh, because he has also invested into your project. Yes, sir. So what are the exit policies? And there should also be a uh, way how you can involve newer persons new person into... Yes. So because now your uh, center is established, so how do you attract a newer talent into your group? Do you have that policy? Into yes, sir. We have that policy also. But of course, initial when we are started, we have invested only 7 lakhs. But for him, it will be 10 to 11 lakhs. Because he initially has not taken the risk of taking or joining into the institution. So some benefits has to be given to the person who has joined that time. Uh, any fresher newcomer comes, we support him. We take a monumental deposit amount initially. Initial whatever cases he handles, we stand next to him. And once he becomes confident, we take the total amount and then allow him to... Yeah, that's another uh, brings to another point that if I can't handle the diagnostic part, or if I can't analyze uh, what is there, or I as a practicing different speciality, I don't do LASIK and I ask you to do LASIK, what will be the... Uh, See, what we have done, sir, because we have only invested 7 lakh rupees, 30%, we have created a company, 30% of the amount goes to the consultant who brings the case and does the case, everything like that. 70% goes to the company. So what in that 30% also we made it, 10% goes to the operating surgeon, 10% goes to the person who brings the patient and 10% in a common pool. Like even if a newcomer, he doesn't operate, but he should get some money out of it. So that 10% goes to the common pool, which will be divided among all the 16 directors. 
How long you are working in this? 2011, sir. Center and for the others, for first center, uh -huh. that is. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pirais. I think uh, you have done a wonderful job and you have given eye opener to all of us. So let us move on to our next topic, uh, Dr. Jayasri Dora. So we will be speaking on dry AMG in long term sequelae of Steven Johnson syndrome. Good evening. At the outset, I must thank the scientific committee for giving me this opportunity of presenting this topic, dry amniotic membrane in long-term sequelae of uh, Steven Johnson syndrome. All of us know the Steven Johnson syndrome, uh, a drug reaction, the devastating condition, and uh, after healing, the skin lesions, it goes fast. Uh, I mean, mucous membrane lesion persists, and um, ocular lesions last to go, giving complications, and uh, sometimes it may give uh, long-term uh, chron chronic stimulation will give long-term complications, dry eye with corneal blindness. Amniotic membrane craft, it helps in acute stage, uh, preventing uh, simliferum and uh, uh, causing uh, limbal uh, stem cells uh, migration over cornea. Um, but here, we, here with, I would like to discuss one case of uh, Steven Johnson's you know, chronic phase where dry amniotic membrane was given. So this is an 18-year uh, female presented with sequelae of Steven Johnson syndrome both eyes um, in the year of uh, 2021 January, having uh, poor ocular surface, patent uh, poncti, blocked mebomian orifices and trichiasis. There was simliferum, corneal opacification, and conjunctivalization of the cornea with development of panos. And uh, left eye was a poor ocular surface, patent poncti blocked membrane orifices, and uh, superficial corneal opacities, like this. And uh, visual acuity was in right eye hand movement, and left eye it was 20 by 60. The patient had history of Steven Johnson syndrome at the age of three years. And her mother was telling that since then, she was showing many ophthalmologists, and she was, she was under treatment for dry eye uh, since the age of three years. And even um, at the age of 16 years, they consulted at a tertiary, premier tertiary eye care center, uh, a center with uh, poor ocular surface, uh, patent punctile, with similar pictures, but at that time there was keratinization of the lead margin was there in right eye. So this was the picture. In uh, left eye, the same picture was there. And uh, visual acuity was uh, same hand movement and uh, 6 by 18 at that time also. And uh, at that institution, they had planned for mucous membrane graft of lead margin only. And they um, advised that they will not touch the cornea. Definitely it is the thing, the cornea may melt and whatever can be happen. So they, they told that only mucous membrane graft will be given at the lead margin only, they will interpret. And, uh, but the patient uh, was not agreed for the surgery after listening this type of um, counseling. Then uh, they told that to use the lubricants, tear substitutes and tactrolimus eye ointment in both eyes. The patient came to us in the year of 2021 at the age of 19 years. Uh, then uh, we had also uh, in dilemma what to do. Then thought, okay, let us uh, take the case and do a simliferon release was done. 
the panels from the corneal surface was peeled up and amniotic membrane was placed over the cornea. The sutures were given, then after that the same amniotic membrane was uh, placed over the uh, bare sclera and also it was reflected to the um, uh, lead, lead margins, uh, uh, under surface of the lead. And, uh, and pa patient was explained regarding the guarded prognosis, guarded visual prognosis. So, but to our surprise, it went well, and the uh, patient's eye is now, uh, after two years of uh, post-op period, it is like this. There is no any simplifieron now. Uh, only so superficial corneal opacities are there in this eye, and uh, left eye is same as stratoscope. This is uh, both eye picture, of a recent picture. Uh, the visual equity in uh, right eye was uh, about uh, 6 by 18. It was improved to 6 by 18. And left eye also 6 by 18 vision was there. This is the, yeah. So after two years post operative in right eye, visual equity was 6 by 18. But recently, in the month of November, uh, in LV, I sent the patient to LB Prasada Institute, where they did a contact lens trial. So in contact lens trial, uh, her vision was improved to 6 by 9. But scleral contact lenses are very costly, and the um, patient is uh, not uh, affordable to buy these. Yearly has to be buy also. But uh, still, uh, we requested uh, LB Prasad Institute, and uh, they, they are giving fast time uh, to free of cost to this patient, scleral contact lenses. So uh, my conclusion is, uh, in a chronic stage also, amniotic membrane is fruitful. In dry am amniotic membrane transplant or wet MG is fruitful in case of Steven Johnson syndrome. <coughs> Thank you. Any comments, sir? If you have keratinization of the lid margins, have you tried in any of your patients with mucous membrane grafts? Yes, sir. In this case, at the age of in the first visit at that uh, Premier Eye Institute, there was keratinization of the lid. But uh, when it pre present to us, there was no any keratinization. So in this case, we didn't put any buccal mucous membrane graft. So after seeing the result of this, recently we have done one case, Steven Johnson syndrome, both eyes very bad condition. So uh, the um, worst eye we took, and we did a mucous, buccal mucous membrane graft on the lead, lead surface, and um, amniotic membrane graft on the cornea and um, uh, bulbar part of the sclera. Thank you very much. I just yes. want to add one point. Yeah. Yes. See the, when you see this case, you, you must notice the palisades of both yes. part of the limbus. If they are there, that means stem cell is there. Yes. So these patients are going to benefit from amniotic membrane alone. Yes. If the patient has got total stem cell loss, then these patients are not going to benefit alone, but you have to put a mucous membrane graft also. Yes. And the best thing, you know, because they are at lifetime, they have to use drops. So the best drops are normal saline eye drops, which are available, so the patient can use it. Yes. In spite of you know, purchasing from the bottle 550 rupees, mm -hmm. I gave them one bottle of normal saline, and I, I told them that, tell them that keep it in a proper way, so that they can use for at least two months. Yes. But it is a survey, uh, three, at the Stephen Johnson syndrome was at the age of three years. And after, at the age of 19 years, vision has improved. That is the thing we have to look. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jayasri Dara, for your uh, nice presentation. So. Our next speaker will be Dr. Sasmita Sahu. I think she has not uh, come. So, other speaker, Dr. Rabindra Kumar Choudhury. Is he there? Dr. Jayasri, is he there? Dr. Rabindra Kumar Choudhury? 
No? Okay. So uh, I think uh, with this, uh, Two people have not uh, reported. So probably we'll be conclude this session now. And there are no other speakers for this session. So may I request all the speakers to come for the photograph. And thank you everybody for participating in this session.